my name is Anne McVeigh. I am a senior English creative writing major. I am from Milledgeville, Georgia, and welcome to Andalusia, home of Flannery O'Connor. Flannery O'Connor was a writer from Milledgeville, Georgia. She was born March 25th, 1925, actually in Savannah, Georgia. She was living there when she was born because her father was a businessman who ran a real estate company. While he's there, he gets very sick and he would have had to go to the doctor and he would have retired early from that job. They would have diagnosed him with arthritis. He then would have gone to get another job up in Atlanta, which Regina and Flannery, Flannery and her mom, three of them would have lived in Atlanta very briefly. And after a little while, Regina decides that that is not the city for her. And so she moves to Milledgeville. This move is what brought Flannery O'Connor to Andalusia and to Milledgeville as a whole. Her father would have been commuting back and forth until they discover that he is actually sick with lupus and not arthritis, causing him to have to retire from his job, live with his family in Milledgeville, and pass away in 1941 when Flannery was about 16 years old. This is really hard on her and it in part is what keeps her in Milledgeville for so long. She ends up getting her graduate's degree at what is called Georgia State College for Women and is now Georgia College and State University. She graduates in three years with two degrees in both English literature and in sociology. She then goes on to get a graduate's degree up at the University of Iowa. She's living up in her 20s, up north in Iowa, in New York, continuing to do writing workshops. And this was when her writing career really begins. She's traveling up north, learning a lot about herself and the environment around her. But while she was there, she started to feel very sick. And some friends would have talked her into going to the doctor, which she does. And she doesn't have a time to get a full diagnosis because she's about to travel back to Milledgeville but the doctor would have told her that she is probably sick with arthritis, but they need to run more testing in Milledgeville. She travels back to Milledgeville for Christmas that year in 1950. And when she goes to the doctor they in Milledgeville, they would have officially diagnosed her with lupus, which she lived with for the remainder of her life. That plays a key role in Flannery O'Connor living in this home because she then stays here to live with her mother from 1950 to 1964. And it's this time that she is enjoying Andalusia and learning about the South a little bit more. And she draws a lot of inspiration from the home and the workers living here and the property itself. She lives here until 1964 when she goes in for a surgery to remove a tumor that had developed and she the surgery for the tumor reactivates the lupus and she passes away that August. She would have been 39 years old at the time. Andalusia was a, owned by the family up until about 2003 when it was gifted to the Flannery O'Connor Andalusia Foundation who ran it as a museum to help promote Flannery's work up until fall of 2017 when it was officially gifted to Flannery's alma mater Georgia College and State University. From that point on, Georgia College has been here and we hope to curate her work to allow more people to learn about Flannery and understand all of her amazing writing. So yeah, let's get started. So this is the dining room. Everything in this room is original. Uh, Regina actually handmade all the curtains that you can see in here. So I think it's impressive that they're even still up and usable. Flannery did play the piano while she lived here. She wasn't necessarily the best, but she did play. Her instrument of choice, however, would have been the accordion, especially in college. She was a very, very big fan of that. And when Flannery does move back into the house, what was the original parlor for the home has to be converted into her bedroom because she would have been too sick to go upstairs. So this room in here would have been the principal entertaining space until the family was able to build on another parlor all the guests would have come in here, and this is very much in Regina, her mother's style. She, this was kind of the room that she was able to decorate the best and to the fullest. And the house was originally in what was called plantation plain style. So this is part of the original structure to the home and what the family would have had when they first moved on to the property. So this room is the kitchen and everything that you see in here is also original from the big stuff like the stove or the refrigerator down to the saran wrap in the corner or all the jars over there. Everything in this room is original. Flannery and her mother would have had their daily meals at this table right here. And while Flannery was living in this home, she actually did manage to sell the rights to one of her short stories for a movie to be made. 
It was called The Life You Save May Be Your Own. It starred Gene Kelly. And when Flannery saw this movie, she notoriously hated it because they take the ending and they change it and the characters fall in love and it's very romantic and it's very different from what Flannery wrote. And she refused to sell the rights to anything ever again during her life. She does, however, make $800 off of this movie and she uses this money to buy her mom this refrigerator. So that's how that ends up here. So this is Regina's office and everything that you see in here is original and what she would have used every day. So Regina was quite the modern woman. She would have been running this farm mostly by herself. The way she ends up working here is actually because of brother, uh, Dr. Bernard Klein. He had purchased the land and when, he had been running it as a dairy farm. When Flannery's father, Edward, passed away, he realized that Regina had no way to support herself or support Flannery and asked her if she would like to help him run the farm, which she does. And when he unexpectedly passed away about six years into their partnership, she inherits the land along with another brother, Uncle Lewis. Lewis, however, is not here full time. Regina would have been the only one here daily, making sure the dairy farm was running right, keeping an eye on all the operations. And at the height of this farm, Regina would have been in charge of 550 acres of farmland, 1,000 acres of forest, the four workers' houses, such as the Hill House and all the workers living here, and the four working buildings, such as the barn. So she had a lot of things to keep an eye on and maintain, and she was also keeping an eye on Flannery when Flannery moves back in here. And her and Flannery are kind of known for having a strained relationship. She complains about her mom in a lot of letters to friends, and there are also quite a few antagonists in Flannery's stories that bear quite a strong resemblance to Regina. It is important to note how lupus would have affected their relationship, however. When Flannery gets diagnosed, she is only 25 years old and at this point had no intention of moving back to Milledgeville. She actually writes letters to friends saying that she plans on moving back up north once she feels healthy enough to leave. She just never reaches a point where she's well enough. So she definitely feels somewhat trapped here it is important to note, however, that when she lived up north, she had written a letter to her mother every single day. And when Flannery does finally pass away, Regina leaves and delusion never really comes back. So they didn't always get along, but they did definitely have a strong bond. So this for our big grand finale is Flannery's bedroom. Now, while Flannery lived here, she kept a very strict schedule. She would have gotten up every morning and attended early morning mass downtown at the Sacred Heart Catholic Church. She would get back here by about 9 a.m. From 9 till 12 every day, she would write at that desk right over there. She would then go out with her friends to the Sanford House Tea Room downtown, get her favorite dessert peppermint chiffon pie, and then she would come back here. If she felt like entertaining guests, she would, but otherwise she just rested for the day. Now, some things to note in this room, Regina would have handmade all of the textiles that you see in here, such as the curtains. And something else that's kind of cool is while Flannery is living here, there are some nuns that live not too far away that had a young girl who stayed with them who had passed away from cancer. And they wanted to write a story about her and they approached Flannery and asked her to write the story for them, which Flannery told them no, but she would be more than willing to help them write the story. So she works with them for quite a while, helps them get their ideas on paper, writes the introduction for the story, helps them get it published, and they are so thankful to her that they gave her two things. The first being a television set that Flannery surprisingly enjoyed watching, but they also gave her that record player over there, which she enjoyed, but after a couple of years of listening to music, said all classical music sounds the same to her and all the rest sounds like the Beatles. So she was a little iffy. But pretty much everything in this room is part of the original collection. The only thing that is not, unfortunately, is the typewriter because that was gifted to her family friend when she passed away. But everything else, including the crutches in the room, would have been stuff that Flannery used every day.